Hello and welcome to the ACES Business Academy. I'm Jamar Brown. Our weekly video coaching series is designed to provide tested real world solutions to the real world challenges today's businesses face. On this segment, Ray Anderson of Anderson Business Coaching joins us to discuss his company's 90 day 10% improvement plan. After watching, if you have any questions or comments you'd like Ray to address, simply type them up along with your name and email address in the form at the bottom of your screen. And we'll respond to you as soon as possible. Now let's welcome our guest, Ray Anderson. Good to see you again, Jamar. Ray, good to see you too. You know, Ray, the last time you were on the show, um, we got a lot of positive feedback and you talked about your Quad Strat program, which is a tremendous business assessment tool. And we're going to circle back to that later on in the program and really talk about how that assessment works and how that can lead to identifying the key issues in business and then your 90 day 10% uh, improvement plan. But before that, I want to remind the viewers about your organization and how it started and really what you stand for, starting with the idea of your no-collar workforce. Well, I appreciate that, Jamar. You know, and as we've talked before, what I learned from all my years of uh, either being a frontline worker and uh, 30 years of business is that, you know, workers who really have no collar, which means that they're not being strapped in by anything, are much more effective than people who feel like they're being bound by something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we always made the contrast between white collar and blue collar. And mm -hmm. white collar seems to be the management people, they have all the thinking, and the blue collar are just the doers. Well, we experienced that if you treat them like businessmen and you make them no collar, it unleashes an enormous amount of creativity and talent and stuff, and you can use it in the organization. I mean, you know, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> that's true, and, and that sounds great. Now, I know as part of that, there are, are five principles of the no-collar workforce, and I wanted to kind of briefly let our viewers um, know what those principles are, talk about them briefly, and then we'll dive into uh, really the purpose of our discussion today, which is to discuss how do we implement uh, a plan for improvement once we identify the problem in business. And the first one is a unified vision. Um, what exactly does that mean? Well, I think, I think one of my experiences, and, and no matter where I've been, if I'm going in one direction and you're going in another um, and you communicate it. You know, communication is about both of us, the sender and the receiver, getting the same message. But the further you get down in the organization, the less the messages tend to be conveyed. Mm -hmm. And so my experience has been that, you know, the vision at the executive level tends to be very different when you ask the people at the front line. They don't get it. They're blind. And and our challenge is how do we engage the front line worker so he says, oh, this is our vision. Mm -hmm. These are the values, this is what we stand for, and this is what my job is and why I have to do it well in order to succeed. Mm -hmm. And if you make that connection, you know, you release a lot more um, cognitive energy. And right. so that's what we're trying to do. Well, and I think as part of that vision is oftentimes, as you mentioned, it, it's sort of the owners sit in a room and discuss what their vision is and they come down from the mountaintop and tell <laughs> their employees what it is. And oftentimes people go, well, that sounds great for them, but what does that mean for me? And yeah. I think part of what you've talked about in the past is the importance of, of ownership and management, understanding that the employees need to be connected to that vision by knowing that when they show up to work every single day, their efforts and their uh, experience in the company not only benefits the company, but also benefits themselves. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the point is that, the truth is that most of us spend r roughly 12 hours of our time every day work-related. Mm -hmm. And so if we can engage that worker so that he really understands his value and sent him in some way, it just makes an enormous difference. We get staggering results because people want to make a difference. <laughs> nobody, nobody got into life by saying, geez, I want to be mediocre. <laughs> right. you know, and so the more we engage them, they, they'll come to the table. It's just the leader's responsibility to make that happen. Absolutely. And the next one, I really um, like the title, Fearless Communication. And I just did a program recently on four ways to conquer fear uh, in your life and in your business. So let's talk about what does fearless communication mean? Well, you know, and I, and I hear this so often, you know, the owner says, I got an open door policy. I don't know why these people don't talk to me. Mm -hmm. And then I go down and talk to the front line. And they said, yeah, I brought up four problems. They call me a troublemaker. So I'm not <laughs> saying anything anymore. Right. And so, you know, fearful communication has a lot to do with the dynamics inside the organization. And you know, how do we structure it in such a way so that they're encouraged to let people know about the problems and these problems are fixed because it really is in the best interest of the employee, the management, and the executives. So you know, just breaking through that barrier, finding out where it is, is, is enormous. And I think you've shared some stories from your yeah. own experience. Right, absolutely. And, and fear does, unfortunately, run rampant in a lot of organizations. Yeah. And if we can just eliminate fear and open the doors for effective communication, I think, uh, 
companies will be amazed at the at the significant turnaround that can happen very very quickly. Well, yeah, and that's that's been our experience. This is not rocket science, but it's amazing how how people how blind people are to the things that are obvious. Right, <laughs> exactly. Now, what about appropriate skills? You know, we talk about skills training and 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 needs of employees, things like that. Yeah. But you talk about appropriate skills. What does that mean? Well, you know, if we look at unified vision and we look at fearless communication, the next step in that is how well are they trained? And I, I kiddingly uh, like to say, you know, when those of us who have kids, and I, and I know you do, Jamar, mm -hmm. you know, you can't imagine taking your daughter out, teaching her how to ride a bicycle, and after she fails four times saying, that's it, no more teaching a bike, you know, I mean, you, we wouldn't do that. And yet when I, I'm in the workplace, you know, the idea of training is like the bicycle, you push them out in the street and say, good luck, and, and let them go, and so they train one another. And because of the lack of communication and the lack of unified vision, the frontline worker may be very well be trained in some way that's totally inappropriate to where they're going. Mm. And so they need a lot more skills, but everybody says, well, they've been trained. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. And what I've experienced is that most of them really don't understand the direct connection between what they're doing and how they could do it more effectively. And it's huge. Mm -hmm. And so appropriate skills is something that they want, but they don't even know exactly what it is that they need. Mm -hmm. And so we have to work on that together. That's a good point. And I know in, in, in my past experience, it was almost like survival of the fittest. You know, they, mm -hmm. they would train everyone and, and it was sort of like, um, you go through a week or two of training and you go out into the field and you go sell and, and they say, well, whoever comes out on top is, is the winner. And what I would always say is, what if we took the time to really provide effective yeah. training and not just put people in the fire, not just throw them in the lion's den? Because oftentimes good employees don't like that. And if you just took the time and said, because I think at the end of the day, the cream will rise to the top. And so mm -hmm. let's give the cream the best <laughs> ingredients to rise to the top mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to throw everyone out there into the fire. So I like the idea of, of the appropriate skills aspect of, of what you do. Now. Go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 I'm... I'm <laughs> <laughs> and then we're both thinking about things, uh, stories yeah. and experiences. Meaningful incentives. And what I've read about your organization and what you teach is that it's not always about money. And people want to jump to, well, if we pay more, we'll get more. And I think from your experience and, and my experience, that's not always the case. So let's talk about meaningful incentives. <laughs> no, I got... And the reason I was smiling, I got to share a story with you. I was... I was in a company one day, and I, and I said to the CEO, I says, well, how many people will work here? Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, about half of them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the point is that, you know, I was looking for numbers, right? Right, right. So in that comment, and he really didn't mean it humorously, but it was very funny at the time. Right. right. And meaningful incentives, as we both know, are not always about the money because as we talked about, you know, people, many of them will spend a whole lifetime working at a job because they like the family, they like the working with the people. But if we were just to recognize their contribution, if we were just to say, hey, what kind of challenges are meaningful to you? Um, how about a, a thank you? Mm -hmm. or, or maybe catching somebody doing something right, right instead right. of mm -hmm. walking out and, and it's the leave them alone zap right. principle, you know? Mm -hmm. And so to me, those are the things when we go out to somebody and say, what's preventing you from doing your job? What could we help you to make your job better, mm -hmm. faster, mm -hmm. simple, or safer? they'll always come back and give me something. Right, and right. they'll say, well, well, how come you haven't brought that up? Well, I have. I brought it up five times. I'm just tired of bringing it up. <laughs> well, and, and, and to that point, just going back to money for, exa for, for a second, and I think it's important people, for people to understand, especially leadership and management, is that money in and of itself is really not the important thing for people. It's really what money means to them. It's not let me make more money. It's let me make money so I can buy my first house, so I can put my daughter through private school, so I can, I can pay for my marriage, so I can you know, put money away for college, so I can put money away for retirement. And so if we can connect money with what it really means to that individual, then they get so much more connected to the organization. But you have to ask questions. You have to have fearless communication. You have to do the things you're talking about to get there. But once you get there, I've seen some powerful tra changes and transitions in organizations. No, and, I, and I exp I've experienced the same thing. And when we talk about meaningful incentives, the truth of the matter, and the guy who said about half of them, if we don't have meaningful in incentives, the good people leave, mm. and we're stuck with the people who are not. Mm. And so that's a double whammy of not having meaningful incentives. And the point is, it's not about money. And, I, and I've had a lot of executives say, well, look, I paid them more, and it didn't make any difference. 
but the mediocre ones stay because, well, I can't find another job or, you know, I'm, I'm happy right here and I'm just working at 50 percent and mm -hmm. that's, that's good. The good ones are saying, I'm looking for more in my life right. and this right. wasn't right. it. Absolutely. You know, so that's the exciting thing about this and that's why meaningful incentives are so powerful. Okay, and the last point here is necessary resources. Kind of walk us through what that means. You know, and, and some people say it's, well, you know, I gave them everything they needed, I gave them the tools I gave them, but sometimes, and you know, and you've experienced this, mm -hmm. I think, you know, you told me once that, you know, you came into an organization that was lowest in sales and within a year and a half because of the style of leadership you brought and you transformed them. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at necessary resources, sometimes people think, well, as I've mentioned once before, you know, we don't have a broom so we can't keep the place right. clean. <laughs> now, that's a pretty obvious example. Mm -hmm. but. The point that I'm trying to make is that we know that the, the frontline worker or a person's experience inside of an organization is a direct reflection of their direct superior report. Mm. If that relationship is strong, if that person treats them with dignity, if that person treats them like you would like to have mm -hmm. your employees treated, that, that person tends to blossom. Mm -hmm. If that relationship is bad, then we see in our quad strat assessment many times, you know, we get these isolated pockets. Mm -hmm. and we realize somewhere now you've got a manager or a supervisor who's probably not treating right. the people they right. need to be. So the resources in this case are good support, mm -hmm. you know, good management, encouragement, mm -hmm. you know, those kind of things that are intangible mm -hmm. but have an enormous impact. So Absolutely. if that makes sense, those, that's why those five things are really important and they kind of drive everything, you know, from where we start with the quad strat all the way to our nine month implementation right. process. Now, another flagship uh, of your program is Good Hearted Leadership. And I, and I love that title. There are a couple of books out right now, mm -hmm. Conscious Capitalism, mm -hmm. uh, Firms of Endearment, mm -hmm. that really talk about this new paradigm in business. And so when I look at, when I think about Good Hearted Leadership, it reminds me of those books and the concepts in those books. Tell me about what that means to you and for Anderson Business Coaching. Yeah, I appreciate that, Jamar. And I think, you know, uh, I've seen your colorization and, you know, and we know that there are some people who are dominant. You know, they're type A types who have very short fuses, et cetera, but it doesn't mean they can't be good managers. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, I, I remember going into one uh, organization where the guy would go out and make heads roll and, and uh, one of his managers said to me, he says, well, you know, he said something and 10 minutes later it's gone and I chew on it for three days. Mm -hmm. um, there you and, go. You know, right. that's, that's a kind of example how that mm -hmm. leadership can be really, really corrosive mm -hmm. as well as good. So, you know, what we've learned over our years is that the style isn't as important as the person's capacity to be able to ask for forgiveness or look for reasons to work together or come back to the person because the ultimate difference between the one percenters, you know, all those companies that all started in their little garage right. and yeah. ended up now being a billion dollar company was that they were effectively able to attract and keep good people mm -hmm and then make them available to be able to delegate stuff so they could focus on what was really important in the business. And that's why 95% of the business struggle to just survive. 80% after five years are gone. <laughs> it's because the leader can't make that transition. And it's not his style, it's his ability to be able to attract, keep people, and delegate things or automate them. And that's, you know, that's right. been our experience. So the good-hearted leader is the person who understands and appreciates the importance of everybody in it. They may uh, react differently. They may have short fuses, but they understand I can't do this alone. Mm -hmm. And if I can uh, take people with me who who are committed right. to what right. I'm doing, Absolutely. you know, the, the sky's the limit. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if that makes sense, that's that's what a good heart leader is all about. Absolutely. And Rand, I wanted to spend the first part of our interview sort of giving some some backdrop about your background and 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 your company because I think it's important when you're looking at at hiring a consultant or having somebody come in and work for your company to really experience who they are and what they're all about, the philosophies of their company. So oftentimes people, people focus on what I do or what they do mm -hmm. and I want to look at who they are. Mm -hmm. What is the philosophy of the organization mm -hmm. because that's going to have a direct impact when they come in and, and work with the organization. Mm -hmm. And so we've done that so far. Now I want to get into what you do. Mm -hmm. In one of the, the most significant programs that you did a program on uh, called QuadStrat, which is available mm -hmm. on our web website, mm -hmm. really helps a company identify the areas that need to be addressed. And mm -hmm. so talk about briefly what the QuadStrat is, and then what we're going to do is put you to task and have you to walk through your 90-day 10% improvement plan so that people get a good feeling of what happens if they choose to work with Ray Anderson. No, I appreciate that. And, you know, what, what we like about the quad strat is that basically 
good leaders are always trying to compare themselves to something relevant in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And our tool, the first thing it does, and you know, is give the executive an opportunity to see how they're doing in relationship to 4,000 other companies in terms of these best practice statements. Mm -hmm. Some of them on strategy, which I like to refer to as the bricks. You know, okay. it's, you know, if you have an architect, he says, look, I'm going to put these together because they'll be strongest in this particular configuration. Okay. The other side is culture which is the mortar. Mm -hmm. And the architect is aware that if I have strong ar mortar and I have a good structure, mm -hmm. you know, the building will stand up. Yeah. But we also know that if, if you don't have good culture, mm -hmm. it'll eventually destroy the mortar and all the structural integrity will, will be gone. So mm -hmm. that's what we look at when we look at the organization. Good leaders understand both those work together. One's high touch, one's high tech. Okay. How do we make those uh, and manage those in such an effective way that we're attracting good people? Okay. So that's what the tool does. Mm -hmm. You know, it gives them a report card against 4,000 other companies. Mm -hmm. That's nice on the outside, but more importantly, what does everybody on the inside think? Mm -hmm. And how do, what do they feel? Because as we've known, I don't, the best leaders in the world are still treated like the king. Mm. You know, people will not tell them the truth because they don't want to hurt them. Mm. And these poor executives are making decisions based on inaccurate, inf well-meaning information. Mm -hmm. So this gives them meaningful information they can then use to be able to improve the organization. So it's a starting point for us to do action planning, which quickly identifies things What everybody says, yeah, there's a challenge here. We want to work together, we want to improve it. Now, uh, speaking of that, um, and we've done the assessment in our organization, and I've seen you deliver it several times. Talk about, you know, what are some of the key areas that the Quasrite identifies in general that companies struggle with or need help with? And then break that down into the, the brick side or the mortar side. And, and I think I've heard you talk about before, a lot of people focus on the bricks, mm -hmm. the strategy, but sometimes a mortar, the culture, is really what needs to be addressed. So right, can right. you speak to that? No, I can. And, and um, you know, one of the, we've done over 65 of these, so, you know, we have a, we have a fairly good understanding of what it takes in our community. Mm -hmm. And basically 80% on the brick side are usually sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, my experience is that most organizations start mm -hmm. not because somebody's a good sales and marketing person like, like yourself, Jamar. Mm -hmm. Typically, they're good at doing something. You know, it could be machining, it could be, uh, uh, any software, whatever that mm -hmm. thing is, but sales and marketing tends to be off their radar. Mm -hmm. And then they get sucked in the vortex, as I like to call it. You know, that's <laughs> that, it's that, that period in which, you know, you're driving into work and you get all these plans you're going to do and you're going to say, I'm going to accomplish this, and you walk in the door and Tom walks in and Peter walks in and, and you get a call from a customer mm -hmm. and pretty soon all your plans are gone because you've been sucked into the vortex mm -hmm. of the day-to-day -day operation of the business. Right, right. And I think the point that we're trying to make here is what I've found, good-hearted leaders are capable of being able to manage those distractions and still keep their eyes on the horizon, okay. you know, not losing their way. And I think that's, that's one of the, the real advantages of, of having a mindset mm -hmm. to look for outside parameters. Where am I? Mm. And I think in the vortex and in the fog of business, we lose that way a lot. Mm -hmm. Good leaders are always open to looking for how do I, how do I, where am I and how do I get to a better place? Well, and, and um, I, I think that's a good jumping off point um, in, in terms of talking about, let's say a company does a quad strat, which, and it's interesting, some companies say, I already know what my problem is, and they call a salesperson or a marketing mm -hmm. person and they come in and do a sales training program, and oftentimes that works. Sometimes they, what they think the problem is, is really not the root cause, and I like, I love the term mm -hmm. root cause analysis. Mm -hmm. There are symptoms in organizations, and then there's the root cause. And it's Quadstrat, because I know it, it's an anonymous survey, helps companies get to the root cause of issues. So let's say a company does a Quadstrat, and they identify um, the root cause of a problem. Mm -hmm. And let's say it's communication or leadership. Let's walk through, then what? You know, we know there's a problem. Right, right. Talk, take us through this 90-day 10% improvement plan, what it means, and how would that specifically address a root cause problem in an organization? Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, the, the issue is that once we do the action planning, it, typically in, when we look at constraints to the quad strat, it'll identify a couple things, as you point out, in strategy, the bricks, mm -hmm. and a couple things in the mortar. And the mortar are typically organizational communication comes out a lot. Okay. And communication, as you and I both know, is, is a very broad topic. <laughs> what right. does that mean? And so a lot of what we do then say, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. 
and what specifically? Is a person capable of being able to say, hey, I've got this problem, and like in Japan, get it fixed in, in a matter of days? Or is he bring up the problem and it gets buried under a, a, a whole bunch of other things that you know, have happened in the vortex? So what we do is we take the, the, all the, the major issues mm -hmm. and we try to reduce them to two or three, at, may, at most four things that we're okay. willing to work on as we move forward. Okay. And the reason that we do that is we find that the more we get going, mm -hmm. the more likely the vortex will swallow it up. Right. And then we simply, in this 90-day plan, our goal is to say, here are the four things we're going to work on. Mm -hmm. And when we do the action planning, we'll simply say, well, look, we don't have a marketing plan. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing we want to do in, in, a, in our immediate action planning is, look, let's make a list of what we do have mm -hmm. in the way of marketing. Mm -hmm. So that's something that somebody can accomplish in a week. But now that we've moved into the next phase, it becomes clear as to, well, who are you going to hire? You know, clearly you don't have enough resources inside, and, and I'm sure you've seen this too. Smart owners realize I don't have the internal resources, and they either hire them, they outsource them, or some other way to, to make up for the internal, you know, difficulties. So that's what we focus on. What are you going to do to fix this problem between now and the start of our 90 days and the end of it? Mm -hmm. And the end of it may not be fixing it because we may have just laid out the plan. Mm -hmm. On the other side, the area where I spend a lot of my time is organizationally, how do you engage the workforce and create incentives for them using those five principles I talked about to get them on board so that they can reduce cost by 10%, mm -hmm. they can increase revenue, they can increase productivity. And 10%, you know, people go, yeah, I can do that. Right, right. You know, it doesn't challenge them and sometimes we put together both 10% and BHAGs, which I'm sure you've heard of, you know, right. big, hairy, audacious mm -hmm. goals. Mm -hmm. But the neat thing about the 10%, once they get it, they start looking at the BHAG. Can we do 25%? Got it, got it. And all of us are goal-oriented. I mean, it, it was, it's, it's, a, it's a function of our, of our purpose in life is to be focused on something. And so when you take a frontline worker and you don't give them any information, you just is rolling along on a day-to-day -day basis, and then you tell them, here's what we're going to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And I, I may have mentioned this, but we had this client who was making the... Um, the PVC pipe for the infrastructure on the superhighway back in the late 90s. Once we told the employees what it was, it transformed their thinking because now they understood the vision. We're involved in the information superhighway. So it gave them a sense of pride, it gave them a sense of ownership that otherwise they were just making PVC piping and putting it in a rack. So there's an example, and then when we establish the plan, the goal is to say, let's look at incentives. What are we doing to incent people? It always astounds me, I'm very seldom inside an organization and as a sales and marketing guy, mm -hmm. when don't you see some kind of a commission based on what's the value to the organization if the guy goes out and sells something? Mm -hmm. They understand that your motivation is, I can make a lot more money if I'm able to sell more. Mm -hmm. The contrast to that, and it's really been kind of a struggle to me if I can look at this, mm -hmm. we try to say, okay, if it's important for you to reduce costs, What's the incentive for the employee to do that? The example I use, is, and if you have your daughter or any kids, you tell them to turn off the light, and they say, okay, and the next morning the light's on again. Mm -hmm. Because there is no correlation in their mind between turning off the light and the purpose that you're trying to get to. Do you know what the bills are every month? Mm -hmm. And the same is true for employees. You know, what we try to do is say, look, can't we establish a meaningful incentive that takes 25% of the savings for all the utilities over the past year and give it back to the employees for having done a good job of figuring out, hey, here's another way to cut costs. All of a sudden, it's changing their thinking, you know, and, and the experience we've had is that that really fundamentally changes their approach to the business. It, it creates that no-collar mindset in which they're actually a businessman and they are incented to be able to help solve the problem instead of be a part of the problem. And I think that's so critical in terms of, of your process, because I think it's very clear what the process is, but mm -hmm. if you don't have buy-in from everyone in the organization, mm -hmm. then it's probably going to fall apart. You right. know, we've seen that in many organizations. Right. And so understanding the importance of getting employees to buy into the plan, and then to understand what's in it for them by being connected to the vision based on how it benefits their own personal vision, mm -hmm. you know, we could see tremendous results. Now take me through some of the some of the the outside of the buy-in are there any challenges that you've seen with implementing the plan 
um, and, and, and how can someone get through those challenges? That's a very good observation. I think, you know, let's take a look a little further. You know, just, just creating, you know, this, this incentive mm -hmm. is a major challenge. You know, uh, we just completed one in which we have a suggestion format mm -hmm. that invites people to submit su suggestions. And if they add value, if they make the organization faster, better, simple, or safer, they get an immediate $50 check. The executive team has to meet on a weekly basis to agree that, yes, this is important. And I'll, the reason I share this with you is that many times they'll come up with an idea and they'll think, well, this is the best thing since sliced bread or mm -hmm. saran wrap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they go to the executives and the executives say, well, no, you know, there's a problem. And we had a client that, that was using uh, trailers to deliver garage doors to buildings and they wanted to move to pickup trucks. And and all the, all the installers said, no, it's going to be a lot harder, there'll be a lot taller, there's going to be a challenge, blah, blah, blah. And so we had to get back with the management and have the management explain, I'm sorry guys, it's only six inches higher, mm -hmm. it's going to cut our costs for liability because we've got these trailers, mm -hmm. it's going to enable us to save other costs, and we really need your support. Right. But the fact that they came back and communicated that, and they got feedback, everybody says, oh, okay, we got it. Mm -hmm. And too many times what we experience is that we don't give them the feedback. The, the feedback loop is typically broken. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, you got these clots of information. If we hadn't explained that to the installers, they would have thought that we didn't listen to them mm -hmm. and they would have taken the results, but it would have created that wedge of, of distrust. Mm -hmm. By having the communication, we open that up. Mm -hmm. So on the suggestion format, it needs to be implemented on a weekly basis. In other words, they have to go and review them, decide whether they're going to get them implemented, whether it actually has a benefit. Mm -hmm. And in this particular context, $50 is the beginning. Mm -hmm. If at the course of the end of the month or the end of the quarter when they have another meeting and they find that it's saved significantly more, they'll give that person even more money. Mm -hmm. But the immediate 50 says, wow, this is meaningful. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the examples of how we implement things immediately to make a change. And, and Ray, um, last but not least, I'm going to put myself in the position of, let's say I'm a C-level executive or a business owner watching this program. I go, oh, that seems pretty interesting. I like what Ray's talking about. The quad strat sounds great. I, I think I can relate to what he's saying. He might be a good fit for my business, mm -hmm. but how am I going to afford this, oh, okay. <laughs> um, number one? And then secondly is, is, is this another program that people are going to do more? I mean, my, my employees already do a lot. Of, I already have all these programs and and you know, I don't want to add something to this. And, and we've had discussions offline about that. So talk about, not necessarily about how much the program costs, because that's, that's, that's you know, outside of this program, but in terms of, of maybe the cost of not doing something, and also talk about this whole idea of 10% versus a major overhaul in your business and how you can help an executive or an owner feel comfortable that this is going to, for the investment, be, be worth 10 times the investment after the end of 90 days. Right, no, that's, that's, that's a very good observation. And, and one, of the, um, one of the things that I learned from Bob Beal, who was, who's a very good um, business consultant, he once said, every CEO pays for exactly what he needs, sometimes he buys it. <laughs> <laughs> and the point is that, you know, it's through frustration, not getting things done or whatever, those, those things happen all the time. The truth of the matter is that when we let these things fester, when the vortex eats everything up, our organization becomes less effective, we become less effective, our people's morale is broken, you know, the costs on that are enormous, and we've talked a little bit about what that is. By switching this around, the return on our investment has been enormous, and one of my best clients, Darlene Jerome, in a matter of 18 months took a company. She'd never been a plant manager in her life, but she took that from number six in a six plant network to number one, by applying the principles that we're talking about here. She was just extremely coachable. Mm -hmm. And what she started off, because they had an incentive plan, she said to a group of CEOs who were invited to hear what she had done, all looking very skeptical about what can this woman offer, right? <laughs> she says, well, last year we spent $400,000 on bonuses. And they're all going, oh, you know, we're, we're lucky to be able to pay our salaries. How are we gonna pay 400,000 in bonuses? Mm -hmm. And then she said, but we made 1.5 million. Now, anytime you send me to Las <laughs> Vegas and say, I'm going to get 1.5 million if I, if I put in 400,000, I'll probably go, be going with that bet. That's good investment. Right? You know? <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's, it's, the point is that this is, 
this is simple, but it's not easy. So I'm not trying to suggest that this is a magic bullet. It's a lot of work, and the 90 days is simply our effort mm -hmm. to get it started and get everybody to buy in at the executive level to mm -hmm. see the value. So that makes sense. Well, and, and I want to, I want to you know, finish up on, on the efficiency piece, but just to touch on cost. I mean, you know, companies are, are, are bleeding right now cost-wise because there's a cost of not doing something. There's yes. a cost of miscommunication. I did a program which is titled The Cost of Miscommunication in terms of, 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 of loss and referrals, customers being upset, social media, and negative feedback, and a whole host of things. And so I think it's important to look at investing in programs that you, a small investment can lead to a major return in the organization. Yeah. So I think that the cost thing should, should be dealt with. The other piece of this is, is my employees already do so much. You know, we have this program and that program, and I love this 10% concept, because it doesn't seem like it's, it's a big investment. So finish up with the 10% the, the and why that's significant to help me as a business owner understand this is not going to be just yet another program mm. to, to put more work on my plate or my employees' plate. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate that. You know, one of the things that we start with, obviously, when we're working on this, is the idea of freeing up 10% of everybody's time. Mm -hmm. And I think the real challenge that we find is that research is pretty clear. 40% of most people's work is wasted, mm -hmm. to use your Kaizen <laughs> yeah. expression. It's really not, it doesn't add any value. Mm -hmm. So the more we help them understand the value, we try to drive that 10% down through the whole organization. Mm -hmm. So free up the executive. So he has 10% more time to focus on the things that Stephen Covey said were important but not urgent. And the truth is, as we move down through the organization, we do the same principle from person to person to person. And when the other thing we find is when we start opening the doors to people and saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm available, people start raising their hand up. Hey, I'd like to be able to do that. So the goal here is to be able to take the next level down and have somebody beneath them say, I'll take on that responsibility, thereby freeing up the person above them to focus on the things that are important. The hardest thing we have is getting people to make that mind shift mm -hmm. because they can either eliminate things that are really not important. That's the one of three things they can do. Mm -hmm. The second thing, you know, they can delegate or outsource. And so many times as we've found, you can outsource things a lot more cost effectively than trying to hire somebody. Mm -hmm. So we help them think about that. And then finally, uh, what do we, how do we use technology to automate things that could really make a huge difference in their organization? So when we get that mindset, people start thinking that way. I don't need to be doing this, I can give this to somebody else, and how do I automate it? And so now you've freed up time, but it's a challenge. I'm not saying, again, <laughs> it's, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. Right. Well, Ray, thank you very much for your time. It, it's, um, it was great to have you go through sort of your company your organization and the philosophy that you guys um, um, abide by, and then also talking through the quad strat and the importance of identifying the key problems in business and not just sort of throwing spaghetti against the wall and hoping something sticks. But it's really identifying what's really wrong in the organization right. and then developing that 90-day 10% improvement plan to really connect the, the, the challenge with the solution mm -hmm. and then to connect the employee's vision and value with that of the organization. And then understanding that from a cost standpoint for the small investment, you get a major return. And then last but not least, it's not going to cause more to the organization. It's really going to be less and more of doing the right things, the right behaviors and the right mindsets. So yeah. once again, thanks for being on the ACES Thank Business you. Academy. Appreciate it. You've been watching the 90 day 10% improvement plan with Ray Anderson of Anderson Business Coaching. If you have any questions or comments based on what you've learned in this segment, just submit them along with your contact information using the form at the bottom of your screen. For additional information you may find useful, please visit our resources page for additional videos and content. Also, if you're interested in speaking directly with a consultant about solutions specifically tailored to your business, the ACES Consultant Alliance includes a host of knowledgeable professionals with expertise in management, sales training, marketing, advertising, social media, human resources, and other key areas. For more information, call us at 951-781-8624 or visit acescalifornia.org and click on the Contact Us tab. I'm Jamar Brown. Thank you for watching this week's coaching session from the ACES Business Academy.